So um, thank you for coming to this demo of the AORSA package. Uh, I'll get us started. First, just get started by saying hello. Uh, my name is Byron. I'm an assistant professor of biostatistics and data science at uh, Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And I have the slides available online for you today. I highly recommend getting the slides open on your own browser, uh, because later when we go into the live coding section of this, you'll be able to click on separate code blocks. And I'll show you where to click. Uh, but when you click, it'll automatically put that code onto your clipboard so that you can just transfer it right from the slide over to a, a local R Studio session. Um, so for today, before we get to the, the cool part, I, I really like to go through a little background. Um, there's a lot of jargon with random forests, and it wouldn't be uh, right to just jump right into the software and start using the jargon without at least trying to give a little bit of uh, support and, and context for these terms. Um, that being said, if this is your first time learning about random forests, I would like to apologize because this will go too fast and it, it may seem like too much information at once, but it, the background section will still be better than no background at all. Um, and so once we've covered a little bit of background, I'll transition over to the demo of the AORSIF package, which focuses on oblique random survival forests and uh, risk prediction. So we'll be covering how to fit models with that package, how to interpret those models, um, how to run a benchmark if you'd like to, and uh, how to extend those models for you know, your own tailored purposes and, and, and ways that you'd like to grow uh, an oblique random survival forest. So starting with the background, we're just going to touch on machine learning, a very broad topic. It kind of comes in two flavors. There's supervised learning and there's unsupervised learning. And we'll focus on supervised learning today, in particular, try and touch on what label data is, um, you know, the prediction problem that we want to focus on, how we engage with that prediction problem, which is learners, and then the specific type of prediction that oblique random survival forests do, which is risk prediction, which is basically saying we can make predictions for censored outcomes. And so we'll try and give the background on all that jargon. All right, so starting out with supervised learning, we have uh, label data. This is a little diagram of a data set. And I just want you to kind of imagine each row of this data set. It's giving you information from a particular person. And uh, you can also imagine that each column of the data set is a different variable. All right, so what makes a data set labeled is that some of the variables are designated as predictors. That's what this x variable is here. And at least one variable is designated as an outcome. And that's what this y variable is over here. Uh, usually, predictors are easy to see, easy to measure. They don't require too much money to obtain. And the outcome might require time or might require more money to, to measure. And so that's kind of why we want to predict the outcome. And so the general problem framework is you're given the x information, and you want to predict the y information. And, the, and so the general way to approach this problem is you, you use a learner. Learner is a jargon term in machine learning. And as far as I know, it's just synonymous with prediction model. So if you hear somebody say learner, what they mean is a prediction model. And you know, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me in chat. But I think over the, over the years, that's kind of how I've come to understand it. So what a learner essentially tries to do is estimate this function f that can go from the information in the x variables and, and map that over to the y variable. And so f is this function that li literally maps from x to y. Um, and uh, we try and estimate that with a learner. And of course, the learner also assumes that this function exists, um, but that's you know, just a technical background. So now we can talk about two specific types of learners relevant to the demo. Uh, the first is the decision tree, and then the second will be the random forest, which obviously is an ensemble of trees um, or a, a big set of trees. So first, let's just discuss what a decision tree is. Decision trees are a type of learner that works through this mechanism called recursive um, partitioning. And we're going to engage with that through some pictures instead of trying to give too technical a, a, an explanation. So I'm going to go through a couple of pictures where we're going to use a decision tree to do classification of different penguin species. And we're going to be using this nice data set. Um, it's publicly available. And it's very clean and, and fun to work with that has chinstrap penguins, gentoo penguins, and adelie penguins. And so we're going to try and predict species using the decision tree. 
So this is what the Penguin dataset looks like if you visualize it as a function of using flipper length on the x-axis and build length on the y-axis. You can see that in this space, there are you know, sort of three different groups, and those groups are kind of the, the species of the penguins. You've got Chinstrap, Gen2, and Adelie here. And if I were to fit a decision tree to these data, it would start by uh, partitioning the data. So what I mean by partition is that it creates two subsets. Um, it does two subsets at a time. And whenever it does this, it, it creates two non-overlapping subsets that if you put them together, you get back the original space. Um, so here's its first partitioning step. It's created one set on the right and one set on the left. And you can see that it's done this by splitting the data right at a value of flipper length of 207. And so over here, you've got um, basically all Gen2 penguins. And then over here, you've got all the Adelaide penguins and the Chinstrap penguins. And so the reason that the subset works like this is that the decision tree tries to maximize the difference between the two subsets it's, cre it's creating in terms of the expected outcome. So the expected species on the right-hand side is clearly um, Gen2 penguins. And on the left-hand side, it's clearly not uh, Gen2 penguins. And so if I were to allow the decision tree to grow another partition, uh, this is what it would come up with. Now it's partitioning based off of bill length, but only on this left-hand side of the figure. And the bill length cut point is 43. And so now in this subset up here on the top left, you can see it's purely almost, almost nothing but chinstrap penguins. And then down here, it's almost nothing but Adelie penguins. And so these three regions are called leaves in the decision tree, which isn't immediately clear you know, why, why it's called a leaf. But when you draw this, uh, the same graph now can be visualized as a binary tree. Um, and you can see that these regions at the bottom are essentially just the three regions that are shown here. Now you can kind of see why they're called leaves. Although this is a tree that's been flipped upside down, um, this is the uh, formulation of a tree that is the reason why people call it a tree. So if you want to compute predictions with a decision tree, the idea is you start at the top of the tree with whatever data you're trying to predict, and then you follow the instructions until you get to a, an ending point, you know, a leaf in the tree. So let's just say that we started out up here and our flipper length is less than 207, so we come down here and our bill length is, I don't know, 50. So we end up in this leaf. So now our predicted value is gonna be given to us by the leaf in the tree. Um, so the predicted species is chinstrap, but the actual predicted probabilities are listed out here. So we have a 6% predicted probability of Adelie, 92% of chinstrap, and 2% of Gen2. And in case you're wondering why that is, this is the leaf that we ended up in. And we can see in this leaf, 92% of the training data that were in this leaf from the tree is fit uh, were chinstrap penguins. 6%, these three dots here, were Adelie penguins. And 2%, this one dot here, was a Gen2 penguin. So the predicted value in the leaf is basically just a summary of the training data that were uh, in that leaf when the tree was grown. So this is the basic mechanics of a decision tree. Um, and now we're ready to talk about the random forest. So the random forest is a big set of decision trees. It works like a committee. When the random forest wants to make a prediction, it gets a prediction from all of its decision trees, and then it does something to kind of make a majority vote or average them together or take some summary of the predictions from the decision trees. Um, so what makes the random forest a little interesting is that it grows the trees with a little bit of randomness. And it's a little counterintuitive because when you grow trees with randomness, you actually make the individual trees less good at prediction, but you make each tree more independent from the other trees. Um, so to get into a little bit of detail, um, what, what actually is randomized when you grow the decision trees in the forest is you get um, tree-specific bootstrap replicates of the training data. Right, so you start with your training data and you just take a bootstrap subset of it, which gives you about 63.2% of the original data in your bootstrap subset. And then you have a little bit of data that's not in the bootstrap subset, which is called out of bag data. And this, th this concept will come back up when we talk about um, stuff in the demo. So I'm just putting the seed in there. Um, and then you also have random subsets of predictors being used every time decision trees in the random forest uh, grow two new uh, branches. 
right? So randomness will make the trees more important, uh, more independent, but it also makes the individual trees weaker. And so it's surprising to see that the random forest actually does give more accurate predictions than a single tree uh, in most cases. And I have a little example here that can help you uh, convince yourself that this is true. We'll, we'll just gloss over it for the interest of time. Um, but I also can show you with some visualizations how the random forest um, does a really nice job of, of computing predictions. So here you can see some decision boundaries from a, a standard non-random individual tree. And it does a nice job of, of predicting our, our pigment data. Uh, now I'll show you what is a decision boundary looks like from a tree that has been grown with this you know, randomization. And it actually does a little bit worse job of creating a decision boundary here, because you can see that it's not quite correctly classifying these purple points, whereas the, you know, the original um, decision tree did. And the reason this randomized tree isn't correctly classifying those points is probably because those points weren't included in its bootstrapped replicate of the training data. So it didn't even see those points when it was being grown. Now I'll show you the decision grid from the random forest. Right? So this is an ensemble decision grid. It's just taking the predictions from all of the trees that all those randomized trees that it's grown, averaging them together. And what's surprising is that it does such a good job. Uh, the decision boundary looks very in tune with the data. It doesn't seem to be overfitting. Uh, let me see here. I can see somebody has joined and is asking about a uh, link to the content. So I'm going to. There we go. Um, uh, thank you for joining, by the way. So now let's just touch on what an oblique tree is. We've kind of covered the basics of decision trees. And decision trees can be either axis based or oblique. Um, an axis-based tree is going to be drawing these um, you know, lines in our predictor space that are perpendicular to the axis that the predictor uh, that we're splitting on is. And so you can see an axis-based tree will kind of make splits like this. We have these lines that are, are drawn perpendicular to the axis of the predictor. And an oblique tree is different from an axis-based tree because an oblique tree uses a weighted combination of predictor variables instead of using a single predictor variable when you uh, partition data. So instead of using x1 being less than some cut point as a, as, a, as a splitting mechanic, we actually use something like a constant times x1 plus a constant times x2 is less than a cut point. And this leads us to get decision boundaries that look like this. We have oblique decision boundaries uh, because these boundaries that you're seeing are, are neither perpendicular nor parallel to the axis. Um, all things considered, I'm not the biggest fan of the term oblique. I don't know what the right name would be, though. So you know, it's, it's just what we call it. And so when you hear the word oblique, you can just think like, oh, these, these are more flexible decision boundaries because we're using linear combinations of variables to make splits instead of just a single variable. And so when you look at the decision boundary from an oblique tree, it's, um, you can see how the boundaries are no longer perpendicular to the um, axis that we're splitting on. And you may also kind of think to yourself, like, oh, this is kind of maybe like what a decision tree would look like if Pablo Picasso had, had designed it. And I was curious about this. I wanted to go over to Dolly, the you know, AI image generator, and see if it would give me back, you know, basically an oblique decision tree decision boundary if I typed it in like this, like a scatter plot in the style of Pablo Picasso. And in my opinion, it's, it's pretty similar, um, pretty similar. So, but what's really neat is that when you ensemble a whole bunch of predictions from oblique trees, you get back a decision surface that looks very um, reasonable, very smooth. In fact, this is the big thing that distinguishes axis-based trees from oblique trees. Um, oh, I see a, a question in the chat about linear subspace trees. I'm not the biggest expert on those. I'm not going to dive too far into it because I'm not an expert and also because I don't want to eat up my whole hour um, with like uh, you know some some other topics, but I'm gonna um, pivot back over to the slides. The um, so the decision boundary that you're seeing here is a lot smoother than the axis-based one, and that, that has lost a lot to do with the fact that the decision boundaries from the individual trees are are not perpendicular to the axis. So another thing to consider is uh, sensory. This is why we have to talk about risk prediction instead of just straight probability prediction. Um, so 
censoring means that we have incomplete data about the um, outcome. Uh, and this happens when you, you may start a study and you may have an outcome like the development of, uh, let's say, hypertension. And you just want to follow people and see when they develop hypertension. So it's, it's like a time to event framework. So over the course of the study, which let's just say the study lasts 10 years, you're going to have some people who have the event and you know, they might have the event before 10 years elapses. So this is here's somebody who has the event at two years. Uh, but then you have other people who decide that they don't want to be a part of the study anymore. So they, they drop out or you just lose contact with them. And you don't know, you know they, they don't have the event up until the point where you lose contact. And so you really don't know if they have the event during the 10 years or not. And so this is what we have to deal with when it comes to um, computing predictions. Um, oh, I see that the speaker sound is echoing a lot. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. Is anybody else getting that um, audio feedback? So an echo in the room? Well, just, um, okay. Okay, I, I guess uh, I'll continue. It seems like it's, it's good enough. Um, so, so anyway, so if we were to be asked the question of, can we predict risk in the next two years for hypertension? Um, we could theoretically use this person's data because we know that they don't have hypertension in the first two years. But if we're asked to predict risk in the you know, next five years, we have to be very careful about how we use data from you know, somebody who was censored at year two uh, because we wouldn't want to assume that they didn't have the event for the three years that we weren't in contact with them. Um, so this is where risk prediction comes into play. And um, not to go too far into the details, but we, we have to be very intentional about how we use sensor information so that we don't bias our predicted probabilities of the event happening. So with risk prediction, we just have to be aware of the fact that we want to make a prediction about the event occurring in a specific time span. And we have to um, sort of specify what that time span is. All right, so this is where random survival forests come into the mix. Random survival forests are designed to, to deal with censored outcomes, and they can give you risk prediction. So the way that these work is that they're basically just the same as any other, you know, their trees are the same as any other decision tree, but in the leaves of the tree, we fit Kaplan-Meier curves, you know, basically predicted survival curves, to the training data that are in that leaf. And this is how we can get um, predicted risk. Somebody will give us a time, right? So if we get a time of 200, we go into this node and we see a time 200 about, you know, all of the, all of the observations in this node haven't had the event yet. And so that's how we can get these predicted probabilities at specific times. And then we aggregate them in the normal way and we get a ensemble prediction from the forest. All right, so now we can put these concepts together and talk about the model that AMRIS fits, which is the oblique random survival forest. Uh, the background of this is that I wanted to fit an oblique random survival forest back in 2018. I couldn't find code to do it, so I wrote something a little rough, and um, I thought it worked well enough. So I wrote a paper, and I, I wanted to share the idea and also sh share the code. And the basic idea was, while we're growing the tree, we'll just kind of fit a Cox model to the data in each decision node, and then use the predicted values from that Cox model as the linear combination of predictors. And that works okay. Uh, it, it ended up being pretty good at um, prediction and a, and a general benchmarking test. So around 2020, um, the code that I wrote was picked up and it was used in a, a separate study to develop a heart failure risk prediction model. And uh, the oblique random survival forest did well in that study which was very exciting, but it also helped me realize as I, I was watching you know, the person I was collaborating with use my, my code and they had trouble. And of course they didn't complain about it or anything like that, but I, I was able to see that my code was becoming a bottleneck in their analysis because it ran slow and it was not as accessible as I would want it to be. So um, I decided after that, that there was this sort of rule in the R universe that I wasn't quite aware of. Um, there are a lot of really good R packages out there, but if you kind of you know look at the R packages that are used most frequently, it's the ones that are fast. You know, the fast R packages really have a lot of traction, and I I don't think that's a problem. I mean, having your work 
run fast and allowing you to make adjustments, updates, and tune things is, is good. So, you know, I realized I, I, I needed to re, uh, rewrite my code and come up with ways to make it efficient and a lot more accessible for users. So I went through this process. It's been, it's been a while, um, but I, I, I rewrote my code and I made it into a new R package called AORSIF. It went through a review process by R OpenSci, which I found extremely helpful. And it was published in the Journal of Open Source Software. That's what JOS stands for right here. And um, I ran a very, a much larger benchmark on it to kind of understand how good it was at making predictions. Um, the benchmark is currently just sitting on archive in a preprint. I invite you to, to check it out. It's, it's lots of details and a lot more details than we'll get into here, um, but it is, it's you know, hopefully pretty comprehensive. And as a bonus, I renamed the R package AORSIF because a long time ago, my dad was developing his own software. He called it AORSA. So I thought it'd be kind of funny if we just basically shared the same acronym. So this gets us to the point now where we can start doing the live demo. Uh, I, I hope the background was helpful. Um, it, it definitely was a fast race through all the topics, but now we can at least have a little bit of shared vocabulary. Um, and so here we can start. The first thing you might want to do is install AORSIF. Um, and to do this, you can run install.packages because AORSIF is on CRAM. And now I'm just going to point out, you can run these, you can open these slides up on your own computer. Uh, the link to the slides is in the chat. And then when you have it open, you can click on this little button on the right hand side of any of these code blocks, and it'll automatically copy the code. And so then you can come over to an R Studio session and just kind of paste the code in. And I hope that'll be a nice, convenient feature for, for folks to use. Um, this is a really nice feature brought to you by the Sheringen Extra Package, by the way. So you're going to want to have a Worsif downloaded, and you're probably also going to want to have the Tidyverse. Uh, we'll use the Tidyverse kind of throughout to just do, you know, things. Um, and a next step in the demo will be to briefly look at the data that we're going to be modeling. So there's a data set in the AORSIF package called PVC ORSIF. It's a very slight modification of the PVC data from the survival package. Um, and you can see when we look at it, um, it's got 276 observations, 20 columns. One column is an ID column. That's you know, not going to be used for prediction. And we have you know, a time column and a status column. These are the you know, time until the event and then whether the event happened or whether the uh, person was censored. And then we have all these other columns that are um, potentially used as predictors. So now we're ready to fit an oblique random survival first. And to do this, um, we use this function called ORSIF. And it's only going to require two things. It requires a data set and it requires a formula. And you'll see on the next slide, there's actually a number of different ways to specify the formula uh, because I, I want to let people you know, use the syntax that they like. All right, so we'll come over to this next slide. Um, if you are a long-term R user, you've probably used COXPH at least once. And you'll know when you use COXPH, uh, you specify the outcome with this serve object. So it's capital S serve. And you put the time variable in and then the status variable. And you can do that if you're using Orsif. There's no need to, there's no need to use this like time plus status uh, syntax unless you like it. You can also specify your formula using the standard serve object. And then you can use most of our formula shortcuts on the right hand side. And what I'm showing you here is you can use this dot shortcut. That means give me all the predictors or give me all the variables in my data set that aren't on the left hand side of my formula. And then you can also use this um, minus sign to say, except for uh, this predictor. So our formula here means give us all the predictors except for the you know, stuff on the left hand side, except for this predictor called ID, because we don't want to use the ID as a predictor. And then, of course, we just specify the data after that. So, a couple of different ways you can specify models with the ORSIF function. Um, and now, I'm just going to flip over to RStudio for a second to kind of 
walk through how this code will run. Um, I'm setting my random seed to be 329 in case you want to get the same fit as me. And uh, I'm using the AORSIF fit right here. And so I can just print it out. You can see the printout comes in uh, a similar syntax to uh, the random forest SRC package. Back over to the slides. So also, if you like using tidy models, um, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think tidy models is a very nice uh, you know, set of R packages. And so as of version 0.2.0 in the censored package, you can now select AORSIF as an engine. So if you wanted to set up a modeling pipeline with tidy models and you wanted to use AORSIF, um, this code is kind of how, that would, how you could do that, right? You specify a random forest, and then you set the engine as AORSIF, and then you're going to have to set mode to be sensor regression because that's all that AORSIF currently does. Um, I do think it'd be great to make it work with you know, classification and standard regression as well. I just need to set aside you know, six or seven months to, 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 to sort of do that. Um, but once you have that random forest specification set, you can then go ahead and use the parsnip fit function to fit an ORSIF model. And you'll see it's just okay. It's, now you get the same printout, right? You get the same worst model, but now it's wrapped up in the parsnip uh, modeling attributes. So it's it's a new addition to the tidy models universe, and I'm you know excited to see how the censored package evolves because I think that they're doing work on that now to integrate that more into like the main part of the tidy models uh, universe. All right, so now we can fit an oblique random survival forest and we'd like to kind of interpret it and get a sense of, you know, what are the variables that are important here and, and how do those variables relate to the predicted risk from the ORSIF model. And um, to kind of give a little bit more background, I just want to touch on this, this term right here, expected risk. So what I mean by expected risk is actually partial dependence which is a little bit of a jargon term, um, but it's, it's a standard thing that people use to um, look at the behavior of a prediction model, especially if a prediction model is considered black box, like a random forest. Um, so what it means is we, we wanna understand how a particular predictive variable um, uh, relates to the predicted risk of, from a model. So we have a model that uses this predictor and we wanna see how changing that predictor will change the model's expected prediction. So we kind of set up this, this procedure where we, we get our training data and we set every value of our predictor to be a specific value. Like we set the value of Billy Rubin to be 0 0.8. And then we compute a prediction for all of the observations in our training data with Billy set at 0 0.8. And we take the average of those predictions and we can you know take the average by taking the mean or the median or the specific percentile. And then we, um, you know, we, we present that sum. And we do this for several different values of Billy Rubin to kind of understand what is the expected predicted risk as Billy Rubin changes and everything else stays the same. Um, so that's actually what ORSIF Summarize Uni is going to do for us. We, we supply an ORSIF model. That's the first thing we need to give it. And then we tell it how many variables we want to summarize. And then it's going to spit back out a little summary table uh, with a little section for each variable. And I'll show you how this looks in an R Studio session. So here I'm going to run ORSIF summarize uni on our fit. But in this, notice I'm saying n variables equals 10 here because I want to actually show you how that looks. So when I say n variables equals 10, I get back um, this output where you know it's it's kind of like a table with different sections. Each predictive variable has its own section, and the sections are ordered from the most important variable to least important variable. And within each section, you can see, you know, for, for the variable taking a specific value like 0 0.8, what's the expected risk? Uh, sorry, the expected predicted risk. And um, what you can do is just look at this little table and get a sense of how the predicted risk changes with respect to that predictor. So when Billy is 0.8, the, expect, the mean predicted risk is 0.23. And uh, when Billy is 1.4, the mean predicted risk is 0.25. A little bit of an increase, you know, it's something to notice. But then when Billy is 3.5, the expected predicted risk is 0.36. Uh, 
that's a big jump, right? So you, you can understand from that, like the expected predicted risk is really increasing a lot when, when Billy Rubin has gone from 1.4 to 3.5. And so, you know, you can scroll down through here and see the other variables that are uh, ranked as important according to this model and get a sense of how the predicted risk changes with respect to those variables. Okay, come back over to slides. I'll also point out, Worst if Summarize Uni currently has a bug on some operating systems. So if you do get an error when you run this, it's, it's most likely because of that bug. And long story short, there's a null value in my code where there should be a false value. And I fixed that in the development version, but I didn't want to push that to cram just before this demo because I was worried that I would inadvertently like break the whole package. I, I know that kind of sounds paranoid, but I, you know, I thought it'd be safer to just let the bug exist. It's only on some operating systems and it'll be fixed soon enough. So if you get an error with Summarize Unity, no need to worry. Um, Summarize Unity is actually based on these functions, which do not have bugs in them as far as I know. Um, these are the partial dependence functions for ORSIF. So ORSIF has these functions to give you a lot more control over how you compute the expected predicted risk or you know, partial dependence. Um, there's three different functions that you can access. One that uses in-bag data from the decision trees, another that just uses the out-of-bag data from the decision trees, and another that uses um, data that you would think of as being new to the decision trees, like testing data or your, your external held-out validation data. Right, so these functions work um, with two inputs. The first input is going to be an ORSIF model, right? So I'm just going to supply fit ORSIF to this one. And then the second input is a specification of your predictors, which I abbreviate as pred spec. So what you want to do here is supply a named list. And the named list will come at, will have variables as the names. And then the values will be whatever values you want to compute and expect risk at. So when I say Billy equals one through five, that means that I want to compute expected risk at a value of Billy equal to one, equal to two, three, four, and five. And so now I get back a very similar table, but I have a lot more control over this table. And, um, and so now I'm going to talk about this blaring thing that I haven't mentioned yet, which is Predhorizon. Uh, you can see that Predhorizon is sitting in this output data set, and each value of Predhorizon is 1,788. So remember when I mentioned censoring and how we had to directly specify what time we were going to predict the interval to occur over. Um, so we haven't been doing that so far. And ORSIF has been noticing that we haven't been specifying any you know, time interval to predict the interval, uh, to predict the event's risk over. And so it's kind of just picked one for us. And the way that this works is if, if we don't set a prediction horizon, the ORSIF functions will set it for us. And they'll just use the median follow-up time in our training data. Um, and I, I'll just let you in on a secret. Um, oh, I can recommend the paper from discussing. Oh, sorry, I got distracted by a question in the chat. Um, I can definitely recommend a good paper for discussing this partial dependence. Um, it's, I think the idea was originally brought up in uh, the greedy boosting, I can't remember what it was called, a, a greedy week reading partitioning algorithm, uh, it, was, it was like the original paper for boosting. And I'll, I'll, I'll look for a link for it um, and try and send it out soon. Um, but switching back over to this Pred Horizon thing. Um, so yeah, so anyway, Orsif will pick Pred Horizon for us. And um, we can sort of, we should actually specify Pred Horizon ourselves though, because that'll make our output a lot more interpretable and kind of allow us to put better context around our predictions. So we're going to use Pred Horizon here to make expected risk more interpretable by saying that we want to predict risk at um, one year after baseline, two years after baseline, three years, four years, and five years after baseline. And we're also going to expand a little bit on how we're using this um, partial dependence computer by saying that we want to predict risk for men and women separately. So you can see I've just modified PredSpec to take um, sex as the variable and then compute it at values of M for male and F for female. And then I'm also going to specify PredHorizon. So it's, the time scale is in days here. So I'm taking 365 days times a value of one, two, three, four, and five. 
And then when I get this result back, I'm gonna use tidyverse to put the data into a, a, a nice format where it's easy to print out and see all the information. Right, so when you run this, you should get values uh, similar to mine or identical if you use the same random seed as me. Um, and you're gonna see that the output will show you the, the prediction horizon, you know, 365, 730, et cetera. Then it'll show you a column for men and a column for women. And in these columns, you'll be seeing the predicted risk at the corresponding prediction horizon. And I also just added this column here, right? You can see I just created a column here called ratio, which is the predicted risk for men divided by the predicted risk for women. And the reason I added this was because you can see over time that the two groups um, sort of have a time varying uh, risk, or rather the, the ratio has a time varying value. Uh, the two groups start out at very similar risk, but over time, men get uh, slightly higher risk than women. And you can see this also. So you can also kind of bring this out by um, specifying a finer grid of prediction horizon values. So like instead of just doing values of, of one, two, three, four, and five years, you can set prediction horizon to go from one year up to five years and just take steps of uh, 25 days. So then you get back a data set that you can plot. And I'm using ggplot here, uh, just kind of using the default uh, themes and stuff like that, and, and creating a line plot. So this line plot is showing us the expected predicted risk for men and women. Uh, men are this line on the top, women are on the bottom, and it's time since baseline on the x-axis and expected risk on the y-axis. And you can see visually the curves are separated. Uh, I tend to think this is a nice thing with oblique random survival forests, uh, because if you were to fit a proportional hazards model, um, you'll know that proportional hazards models assume that these effects are are not time varying uh, by default. You, you can set them up so that they do have time varying effects, but then you'd have to know which effects are time varying, and you may not know that. Whereas with random survival forests, this is done for you, and um, you don't have to know ahead of time which, you know, which effects are going to be time varying and which ones are not. Uh, so this is kind of a neat, a neat thing with the random survival forest. So now we can also look at this. Um, you know, partial dependence output with a fixed prediction horizon. And this allows us to kind of look at the expected risk profile over multiple variables. So here we're just going to fix the predicted, um, the prediction horizon at uh, the medium. And we're going to investigate how these three variables um, may or may not interact with each other. So we've got Billy Rubin and we've got edema. This is a, a categorical variable with three levels. And we have treatment. And this is a categorical variable with two levels. And you can see here, I'm kind of just using a shortcut by saying, I want to look at a DMAP with all of its uh, categories. I'm doing the same thing with treatment. And then I'm just setting Billy to go from one to five, but I want to have 20 different Billy values because I want to look at this in a, in a figure. And so now I'm going to run this using this prediction specification, using the same function as before, force of PB out of bag. And now we're going to get a figure. and I, I, I'll probably switch over to our studio in a second because I think this is kind of an interesting figure to look at. And we can just make sure that the code runs. Um, but when you, when you create this figure, you can see that we have about three different groups here in terms of predicted risk. We've got this group right here, this group in the middle, and this group on the bottom. And these groups are really determined by edema status. So edema um, has, a, has a pretty big impact on predicted risk. If edema is zero, you're in this group down here. If it's 0.5, you're in the middle. And if it's one, you're up here. But as Billy Rubin increases, you'll notice that this middle group actually starts out uh, closer to the low risk group. And then as Billy increases, by the time Billy is up to five, you actually see that this middle group is a lot closer to the high risk group. So, you know, long story short, Billy Rubin is modifying the relationship between the edema value of 0.5 and predicted risk. And so you could think of this as a two-way variable interaction. And um, the oblique random survival forest has automatically picked up on this and, and is, is showing that to us in this output from um, the, the partial dependence function. And so again, this is nice because if you're fitting traditional models, you don't necessarily know whether two-way interactions exist, um, but you can fit a random survival forest, it'll find them for you. 
and then you can in turn go look for them in the, in the you know interpretation of that random survival force. So now we're going to pivot and talk a little bit about another way to interpret the random survival forest, which is variable importance. There are three ways to compute variable importance with the random survival forest um, in a ORSIF. I'm going to try to cover bare bones of the details. I want to be um, I just want to be aware of the time and not and not spend too much time on, on the on the background. So the first way is to compute ANOVA importance, and this comes out of a great paper called. Uh, on oblique random forests by um, Lindsay. It was published in 2013 or so. And there's references for it in the documentation for, for ARSIF. The basic idea is when you compute linear combinations of predictors, you're going to find a p-value for each predictor. And you'll keep track of the p-values uh, that are corresponding to all the predictors, right? So every predictor has a whole bunch of p-values. And you can simply compute the proportion of times that the p-value for a predictor was very low. And that proportion is going to be the importance of the predictor. So the idea is, if the predictor always has a very low p-value, it's probably important. And if it's always got a not so low p-value, then it probably isn't that important. And so obviously this is like going to have some limitations, but it's, one thing that's great about it is it's very fast. Another way to compute variable importance is this more traditional method of permutation. This is where you've got a forest that you've already fit in and you know it's um, prediction error. Uh, so now you're going to permute a predictor, and then you're going to reassess what the prediction error is after the predictor has been permuted. Um, so what that looks like is we have a fitted forest here, and I'm going to permute the value of flipper length. So here we go. It's, oh, it's been permuted. And now we can see from the picture that we actually have a lot of misclassified points. All these you know, Gen 2 penguins that were originally classified as Gen 2s are now being classified as chin straps, and that's incorrect. So we can see that permuting this variable has really messed up our random forest prediction accuracy. And we can quantify how important that uh, variable is by how much worse the prediction accuracy got. So, and this is kind of, I'm, I'm a little hand wavy here. This isn't exactly how it works with the picture, but it's, it's the concept. Um, so another way to compute variable importance with AORSIF is to use something called negation importance. And this is similar to permutation, but it has a little bit of a different philosophy. Uh, so actually, for each predictor, instead of permuting the values, we're going to go into the forest itself and multiply that predictor's coefficients by negative 1. So if it's in a combination of predictors that its coefficient is, is like 1.6 or something, then that's going to be converted over to negative 1.6. And what this effectively does is it reverses the slope of, of the uh, decision boundaries in, in the trees. So again, a little hand waving here, but what this conceptually means is that we have a fitted forest here. And instead of permuting the values, we're actually going to flip the decision boundary. And when we do this, we can see that we, again, have a lot of misclassified points. And because we flipped all the decision boundaries just based off of flipper length, uh, we can conclude that flipper length is an important variable. Uh, so all three of these methods are accessible in a ORSIF. Um, there's a sort of a family of functions called ORSIF underscore VI for variable importance. And you run that, um, you know, you can run that function on a fitted ORSIF model, like, I've, like I'm doing here. And you can also just specify when you fit the ORSIF model, what type of importance you want to compute. All right, so there's two ways of getting it done. Okay, so we're now at the point where we can ask a question. Um, you know, we see that we can fit these ORSIF models and we can interpret them, but it's kind of important that they give us predicted risk that is somewhat accurate uh, because there's not much point to interpreting predicted risk if the predicted risk isn't, you know, a good predictor of what's actually going to happen. Uh, so. I've run a, a larger benchmark in my preprint on archive over 35 different prediction tasks. But in the demo here, we're going to look at a smaller benchmark over about 11 different prediction tasks. And you will be able to run this on your own systems if you want. Um, but just a fair word of warning, you'll have to install MLR3 and the associated R packages for survival with MLR3. And some of these are not on CRAN. So It'll just take a little bit of extra uh, legwork to get them up and running on your system. 
Uh, luckily, you can also just follow along in the slides and, and take my word for it that I'm not making up the results, which I'm not. So what you'll see here is all the packages that I need to load to run this benchmark. And um, what you'll see up here is kind of what the benchmark is going to do. Uh, we're going to use MLR3, and we're going to be comparing the prediction accuracy of models with AORCIF to uh, the prediction accuracy of some random survival forests that use axis-based trees. In particular, uh, we're going to be using the random forest SRC package, uh, which does survival regression and classification forests. And then we're also going to be using axis-based uh, random survival forests from Ranger. Uh, so you may have used these packages before, and you, you may not have, but the general idea is that these are, these are very widely used R packages for random forests, and they're, they're, they're quite good, very good random forest packages. So we're going to run an experiment where we basically fit a model with each of these three different learners, and then we validate that model in some held out testing data. And um, now I'm just going to flip through some, some slides to show you where I'm getting that testing data or that data from. Right? So first, we'll use our uh, PVC or SIF data. And you can see that I'm making this thing called the task. That's because the general syntax of MLR3 is one where you, you create tasks for prediction. So that's why I'm using this, this task name. Uh, I've got another task with data from the Veterans Administration Lung Cancer Trial. And this data actually comes directly from the Random Forest SRC, so it's pretty easy to make a task with it. Some other data that I'm pulling out of the OpenML R library. OpenML is a very handy uh, R package. You can just grab data sets that are publicly available and download them from the OpenML um, website. Another data set from OpenML, um, lung cancer. Another data set, this one's coming out of, I'm not quite sure, oh, out of the survival package. Um, and this is from a, a cancer trial. Uh, this cancer trial actually had two survival outcomes, and so we're, we're making a separate prediction task for each of those two outcomes. And now we're going to put all the tasks together in a list. And you can see at the bottom of the list, there's a couple more pre-made tasks. And these are just tasks that are uh, already available with MLR3. So we've got 11 different prediction tasks in total. And we're going to set up a little benchmark where we go through each task separately. And with each task, we're going to be running five-fold cross-validation. So we start with the full data, split the data up into a training set and a testing set. On the training set, we'll fit three models, one with ORCIF, one with Random Forest SRC, one with Ranger. And then each of these models will make predictions for the testing set, and we'll evaluate how accurate those predictions are. And so here we're saying these are the learners that we want to use. And then we're going to say, here's how we want to evaluate the accuracy of those learners. We'll get a graph score, which is also a Breyer score. I hope you've heard of at least one of those. I don't have enough time to really go into what they mean, but I'll just say lower values are better for the graph score. Um, we're computing a C index, which is going to tell us how, how well the model discriminates between cases and non cases. We're going to compute a calibration score. And so this is a slope that we want to be equal to exactly one. The closer to one it is, the better. And then we're also going to keep track of how long it takes to train our models because, you know, as I mentioned before, um, people prefer not to use slow software. So faster software is nice, assuming it works. Um, and then we actually, you know, create our benchmark. That's what this code is going to do. And then we'll run the benchmark and we'll pull out the scores of these three different models. So when we do this, uh, we can summarize the results with this bit of code here. Uh, you can see this is just kind of a, a little bit of tidyverse mixed in with, uh, um, well, this is basically just tidyverse stuff. And here's the summary. All right, so this is where, yeah, this is where we're actually able to co compare the prediction performance of our, of our different learners here. So the graph score column, we can see the expected graph score over all 11 prediction tasks. And the average for AORCIF is 0.143. And then the average over here is 0.146 for Random Forest SRC and 0.156 for Ranger. So remember, the graph score lower is better. Uh, and so AORCIF kind of gets a little bit better score here. Uh, the C index, now it's higher is better than the C index. So AORCIF gets a score of 0.734. Random Forest SRC is just a little bit below that. And then Ranger is just a little bit below that. 
Uh, next up is the calibration. Uh, the closer to one, the better. So you, a, a perfect calibration gets a value of one for the calibration slope. And the ORCID is coming in at 0.994. Random Forest SRC comes in at 0.985, a little bit further away from one. And then Ranger comes in at 1.07. And then very last thing, I realize I'm just reading a table to you, but you know, it's like all this is valuable information. So I'm just gonna um, kind of cover it. Uh, next last thing is the time to train, right? So here you can actually see ORCIF is, is, is efficient, which is great because, um, you know, oblique trees are actually very hard to fit efficiently. Um, and that's been the main challenge of developing a ORCIF. It's like, how do I how can we fit these trees in a way that won't take, you know, days to, to, to finish? Um, and if, if you're interested in exactly how a ORCIF actually does do this quickly, uh, the archive preprint has quite a lot of details on that. I'm not going to go into it here because this is just de de demonstrating the use of and how to use it. Um, but uh, yeah, I find it interesting. I will say the caveat here is that MLR3 has forced these learners to run on a single processor. And Ranger and RFSRC are both designed to be run in parallel. AORSIF is not quite. Oh, good question about the scale. Uh, that's in seconds, I believe. So um, on average, that's the number of seconds it took to fit a model. But thank you for that question. It's a very good question. And so um, the, the comparison here is a little bit biased because AORSIF never even, I didn't write AORSIF to use parallel processing. I probably will at some point. But Ranger and RFSRC expect to do parallel processing. And when they do, they, they, they run very efficiently, more efficiently than AORSIF run in, in many data sets. So, it's a little bit biased. I wouldn't take this as a final say of the efficiency of these R packages, but it does at least show that a is, is is not slow. So now we'll just briefly touch on how you can take a and tailor it a little bit so that if you don't, you know, if you don't like the pre-built way that a finds linear combinations of predictor variables, you have a lot of control over that. You can change that and, and modify it to do exactly what you want it to do. So when you fit AORSIF models, you can supply this control argument. And um, the control argument should be the output of one of these different control functions. And uh, there's four functions available right now. Uh, the default one is to do the fast version of AORSIF. So this just runs the fastest. And then you can also use, instead of fitting uh, this like partial Cox regression model, you can fit a penalized Cox regression model which runs you know, substantially slower, but it does perform better in some cases. And the one that I find the most interesting is the control custom function. Uh, and I'll show you how to use this in a second, but this allows you to create your own function for finding linear combination of predictors. And then you just supply that function to ORSIF and it, it takes it and uses it for you. Right, so, so here's how that works. Let's say that I wanted to make an oblique random survival forest and instead of you know, finding this linear combination of predictors with Cox regression, I just want to find some random coefficients and combine my variables that way. So I'm going to make a function called f underscore random for you know, making random linear combinations. And all this function does is it returns a matrix of values from a random uniform distribution. And then that matrix will be used as my linear, the coefficients for my linear combination. So then I, I take this function and I pass it into the force of control custom function, which I then I pass into the control argument of force of, and now I get back my, my customized oblique random survival first. And there's a lot of different things you can try with this. Um, maybe you don't want to do random coefficients. Maybe you actually want to apply principal component analysis and use that as a way to find a linear combination of predictors. And so I'm not the biggest expert on principal component analysis, but I, I can at least write a function that uses you know, the PR comp function and then pull out one of the um, principal components from that. And here I'm actually pulling out the second one because when I experimented with this, the first one was more or less dominated by one variable. So it's like, that's basically just fitting an axis-based forest, but the second dimension was more you know, a good mix of variables. So that's why I'm using the second dimension. But then I just pass this in, and, and now I'm using principal component analysis to, to fit an oblique random survival forest. And so you, you, know, you can write these functions yourself, and you have a, a good bit of control 
over how the random survival forest works. And of course, the thing that I'm not really mentioning is that it's very easy to uh, cause your R session to crash if you if you send R functions into C++. So you know when you do this, there there are some nice error. Um, there are some functions within ARSF that'll test your function out. And if your function looks like it's going to cause your R session to crash, it won't be sent into C++. Instead, you should get back an error message that kind of says, like, here's what it appears your function is doing that is going to cause the R session to crash. And so here's how you can hopefully modify it and make it work better. And um, I see a little question in chat, so I'm just going to read that real quick. I think there would be. So the question is, would there be a certain function to use that would make uh, a standard random survival forest? And um, there are a couple of ways that you might be able to get at that. So you could kind of just say, return a matrix where all the coefficients are zero except for one. And that would give you a standard random survival forest because you're, you're just using a linear combination, but you're removing some variables with that linear combination by multiplying them by zero. Or, I think you could also fit the random, the oblique random survival forest with a value of one for M try, so that you're actually creating linear combinations of variables, but you know, there's only one variable. So it's like that's that's a, a trivial linear combination, um, but you would end up with something that looks a lot like an axis-based um, forest that way. And so, great question. Um, so so now. If you ever want to tune your random survival forest, this is kind of the way that I think about doing it, just by comparing the accuracy of the forest based off of its out of bag um, predictions. Right, so here I've just got three different approaches to fit this random survival forest. One is the default approach, one is using random coefficients, another approach is to use principal component analysis. And I'm pulling out the prediction, the out of bag predictions from these three separate fits, right? So I'm creating a list of risk predictions, and then I pass that to the score function, which this is a, fun, a function that exists in the risk regression package. And it does a very nice job of, of evaluating accuracy of risk predictions. And so now you can just kind of get a look at how the three different approaches did. Uh, the default approach has an AUC of 90.8. The other approaches do surprisingly well. I'm very, I'm very surprised that you can just take some random coefficients and you get back a pretty good AUC. Uh, that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, it's also interesting that this principal component analysis does almost as well as the uh, approach of using Cox regression. In fact, I don't have them in my slides, but there are a couple of data sets where the principal component analysis is better. So I'm very interested in what people may think of when it comes to, you know, new ways to find linear combinations of predictors because there is a good amount of variability in like the performance of the oblique random survival forest that's explained by how you're actually computing the linear combinations. Um, so thank you for sticking with us till the end. Um, this is just a list of what we covered. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the funders of this research. And, you know, it's been really nice to have some time to you know support a time to work on this. And of course, the, the collaborators who have helped along the way are all pictured here. Um, really great set, really great group of people. Uh, and so we're right at the top of the hour. If anybody would like to email me with questions, I'm just gonna type my address into chat. Uh, please feel free to send me an email if you have any questions and maybe we have time for some questions here, but um, otherwise, thank you for coming.